Wow. Thank you, Doug. Good singing with you all. Good being with you. Good seeing you today. Just to, just to look at you uh, does my heart good. Wonderful. Maybe you've heard me say this before. I am a sucker for a good superhero movie. Uh, my girls and I have been trying to work our way through the Marvel movies this summer, watching them over again. You don't have to like them. You may say that's ridiculous, but I like them. Uh, when I was a boy, I used to watch George Reeves play Superman on TV. First it was black and white, and then it became color. Um, I'd watch the Justice League cartoons sometimes on Saturday mornings. And I loved all the superheroes, but my favorite was Aquaman, even had the action figure. If you're a real superhero fan, you know these better than me, uh, how these folks got their superpowers. Uh, several websites would give you some broad categories. You may not care about this, but some of you might. Uh, this is how some of them got their powers. Some experienced a freak accident. Or, or they were, which brought on these superpowers, like Barry Allen hit by a lightning storm became the Flash. Peter Parker bit by a radioactive spider became Spider-Man. Bruce Banner infected with gamma rays became the Hulk. Some were aware that they uh, could get better or become super by uh, an experiment. They volunteered to be guinea pigs like Ant-Man, Captain America, Deadpool. Uh, some were given the privilege because they were worthy to receive it. Now, that explains the likes of Green Lantern or Captain Marvel or Doctor Strange. And then some came from their own special home or place of origin. And, and when they came here or, or came to be known, we found out they had superpowers like Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, or Thor. Now, some transformations are incredible. And watching them on the silver screen does something to my heart. I like that. But that's fiction. That stuff doesn't really happen. I'm, I hope I didn't burst some of your bubbles, but that is not true. What is true and what is real and what is truly inspiring is to see a human, a normal person, going from just a normal person or even somebody who's bad, who, who becomes then different, good, or extraordinary in their own right. And perhaps nobody tells that story, or you see a better, bigger turnaround or transformation than Saul, the persecutor of the church, who becomes Paul, the apostle of the good news to the Gentiles. If you've been reading these last two weeks, and you've been reading about his story, he tells his story three times in Acts. I hope you've read it. I'm not going to go over it. It's powerful. Every story after that really becomes the bigger story. It's not so much about Paul, it's what God is doing through Paul. And Paul loves nothing more than to point to Jesus, to talk about Jesus, to introduce people to Jesus, maybe for the first time. The heart of his message is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And you can't help but find that out if you read it. He bought, Jesus bought the redeemed with his blood, through his spirit, brought the new kingdom to earth, established his body on earth, the church, and that church is the hope of the world. As Mike prayed, the disciples of Jesus have these treasures in earthen vessels. They deliver the good news to a lost and dying world. They tell the story. Jesus does the transforming. But I've, I've already gone too far. Let me, let me go back, because I jumped ahead way too fast. See, Paul didn't even believe what I just said. When he was Saul, he thought that was stupid. He would have told you that. When people still called him Saul, and he was still esteemed among the Jews, he didn't believe anything about Jesus, that he was that, or his followers were good. He figured Jesus was a fraud, a blasphemer, a troublemaker, who deserved the trouble he got. He even deserved to die. He was perverting the truth and undermining the law and killing Judaism. He believed the followers of Jesus needed to be stopped and should be jailed. And if they died, so be it. He watched the coats of the ones who stoned Stephen to death, and he must have enjoyed that. I bet he smiled when he had a chance to help in his own way to squash this new destructive movement, movement of the disciples of Jesus. He did it. And if he had to single-handedly, he would do it. And he tried. He's on his way to Damascus to jail some more of them. That's when Jesus lights up his world and turns him upside down and sets him on a new path. Turns this persecutor of his church into his number one ally and leader of the movement of believers. Talk about transformation. Paul could tell you a story, and he does. Did you hear it? 
Even the disciples at first couldn't believe the story was true, but it was true. Saul, now called Paul, was a changed man and God's chosen instrument. And God had been working all along since the beginning of time to start with the Jews, to bless the Jews, to send the Messiah through the Jews, to eventually get to the Gentiles so that all people could be blessed, so that all people could know Jesus, so everyone could be saved, Jews and Gentiles alike. But it's in the life of Paul that we start to see it come true. As we've read this morning, he must have picked the right guy for the job because he does it well, even though the job eventually kills him. The Spirit sent him out with Barnabas on this first what we call missionary journey. As the Jews hated to hear him preach, some still loved it. He kept preaching in the synagogues and in the towns. His journeys and his partners and his destinations change, but the reception of the Jews also changes. And you read it if you've been reading it. The change happened. And really in this one big moment, not for an individual, but for a whole people, it happened in Pisidian Antioch. You might have missed it if you weren't paying attention. Because Paul is again preaching in a city to the synagogue, to the people there, Jews and Gentile converts. Some loved it, wanted to hear more. Others hated it and rejected it completely. But listen to what Paul says, because here it comes. We had to speak the word of God to you first, you Jews. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, and they did. Paul traveled along. The Jews kept dogging him, bothering him, stirring up the crowds against him, even trying to kill him. He keeps preaching. But watch the focus change from the Jews to the Gentiles. I think it always frustrated Paul that God's own people, Jesus' own people, Rejected it for the most part, but Gentiles kept loving it. There are exceptions, but generally speaking, most Christian churches, people who would say, I believe Jesus, they're filled with Gentiles. And I am looking at mostly, almost completely, all Gentiles. The Jews, for the most part, still can't quite believe it. But it still surprises me in an open field in Brookline, Missouri, a whole bunch of Gentiles get together to talk about the one born in the tribe of Judah from the womb of a small Jewish girl named Mary in a dinky, stinky part of Bethlehem, placed in a feeding trough, believing he is the Lord of the heavens, the great I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the light of the world, the Savior of mankind. There are lots of stories of Paul and letters of Paul, and there's no way we can do justice today. But a couple of things to point out. One, I love the language of Acts 14. Paul and Barnabas are sent out on the missionary journey. They come back to the place of origin, Antioch. They report to the church what has been happening. And this is how Luke records it. Listen, on arriving there, They gathered the church together and reported. They got together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. I hope we always preach the good good news of Jesus from this pulpit and in every classroom and with everyone we all come in contact with. And I hope we celebrate all the good that happens because of this, because of us, because of what happens here. But, but, and I need to be clear, I want to be sure that we always talk about the great things that God is doing, not that we are doing. And the difference to some may seem small, but it is the difference that makes the world go around. It is what changes things. It is God who changes things. You may not know this, especially if you're new here, but last month was our 14th anniversary for being in Brookline. And if there is anything good that has come out of 14 years of us being in here and out there, then it is God who should get the credit every single time. And if you've been reading what Paul writes, then you watch, you read, you listen to how often he keeps pointing to God. He is the one who does it. 
He can't help himself at times, but to just start writing into praise. He starts talking and reasoning and arguing and preaching and challenging, and all of a sudden he starts thinking about what the Lord has done for him, and he starts praising. I, I hope we are today moved to praise. And every time you consider what God has done through us, then let it turn to praise of him. Did you see what Paul was doing everywhere he went? He and Barnabas would preach. If they converted some, they established the local church. And they immediately, if they could, appointed elders. And as they would move on, they would think back and write back and sometimes visit back to that church. But always, always, in Acts 14, as it says, that their action plan was to strengthen them, especially the new Christians, but strengthen them and encourage them to remain true to the faith. And I think that's what we're doing today. I, I don't know what you're doing today. And, and it's possible you would come in here and just leave without even knowing what you're doing today. But I would hope before you leave, you would consider that your job here, my job here, our job here is to strengthen and encourage each other to be true to the faith, to hold on to the faith. We started this morning thinking about transformation. And you see it very clearly in the life of Saul, turned Paul. And this is a good place to stop and ask, and what about you? Have you been changed? Have you been transformed? Did you meet Jesus? Maybe not on the side of a road where you fell on your backside and saw a light and then couldn't see it all and then saw very clearly. But has your world been turned upside down or did you just find a decent place to go to church? I would hope the good news of Jesus, that he came and he died and he was buried and he rose again and he now sits at the right hand of God ready at any moment to come back and take his home with him. I hope that changes you. I hope it has already changed you. I would love to think that you would respond in the way 3,000 did on one day in Jerusalem at Pentecost. Or just as a sweet lady named Lydia did out by the side of the river. Or by a Philippian jailer who was ready to kill himself and yet found new life in Jesus in the middle of the night. Believe in Jesus. Repent of your sins. Be immersed in the name of Jesus. The only name that can save you. There are some things that you may not know about Michelangelo, or as some maybe say more accurately, Michelangelo. History Channel says these things about him. A jealous rival broke his nose when he was a teenager, and his nose was never the same. Did you know that? He rose first to prominence after a failed attempt at art fraud. Shame, shame. And he carved the most famous David statue from a discarded block of marble. He was notoriously picky about the marble he used, but on this one he picked one that nobody else wanted. And it was considered unworkable by some. It was known as the giant, so they say. Quarried nearly 40 years earlier than abandoned. By the time he started working on it, they say it was more than one frustrated sculpture who already tried. And what he did with this work of nothingness was be really in his hands to become a work of art. And you can go see it today. We have amazing. What he is reported to have said, if true, is every block of stone has a statue inside it and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. Maybe you think that every one of us is a work of art just waiting to be discovered. That inside we are really beautiful and lovely and a treasure just waiting to be revealed. Maybe you believe that each one of us is really a princess or a superhero. Deep down, we just don't wear a crown or a cape. That's the stuff of Hollywood that sells comic books and tickets to the theater. And nearly every Disney movie somehow ends with that. But did you know the message of the Bible is very different from that? Romans 5 contains my favorite scripture in all the Bible. 
I have quite possibly worn it out, and I'm not the only one that loves it, but I still love it because it's my story. And just a little while, Jeff's going to read it, so I won't do that because we're going we're to think about our communion time together and what Jesus has done for us, and that is the perfect picture of what he has done for us. I won't read it, but when you hear it, would you consider the transformational message of it from what we were to what we have become all because of Jesus? I like how Paul says this in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Now listen, because this is still today a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Here's the truth. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. And you don't know me, maybe, but that is true of me. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience and as, a, as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. And here's where Paul gets to praising again. Because as he writes that, he can't help but then write this. Now to him, the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, to him be glory and honor forever and ever. And he says, amen. And it's true. That's the truth. I don't mean the truth of a scripture, an old book. I mean that's the truth about me. I am the big sinner in the story. It's my story. It's he saved me when I did not deserve it and could never earn it. That is what has changed me. His mercy, his grace, and I hope I never tire of praising him for it. There were so many tragic stories that came from 9-11. It's, it's almost old news now, but I didn't know this story for years until I came across it. Ron Clifford, an architect from New Jersey, just happened to be in New York because of an interview. His sister Ruth talked to him that morning before she got on a plane. She told him, wear your bright yellow tie so it stands out and you'll get noticed. So he did. He put on his yellow tie. He took the ferry over, checked in at the Marriott Hotel, which just happened to be under the Twin Towers. And that morning when the first plane hit the North Tower, he found himself helping a woman who was burned severely. She was just waiting for a bus on the street below. And when the plane hit, the burning jet fuel came down and doused her and burned over 98% of her body. In an interview with The Mirror, he described how her hands were swollen and her clothes and even a zipper on her sweater was like welded to her skin and her sneakers were virtually gone. He's caring for her on the ground, the floor of the lobby, when the second plane hit the South Tower. He finally gets her to an ambulance and he walks to safety, though partially burned himself. He'll never forget that day. He can't forget looking up, watching people plummet to their, to their deaths. But he also discovered several hours later that day that his sister Ruth, who told him to wear the bright tie, she and her four-year-old daughter, Juliana, were in the second plane that was hijacked and flown into the South Tower. So imagine that. He's there below in somewhat safety, helping a woman survive the mayhem, as his sister and niece are just above him being killed didn't even know it and to add more heartache to the story the woman he helped the burning woman she died 40 days later he had gone to visit her placed his yellow tie on her hospital bed before he left there are so many tragedies in life but there is no greater tragedy than to know that the innocent, righteous, sinless Son of God died a horrible death on a Roman torture machine so that I, the helpless, hopeless, ungodly sinner that I am, could live. And it may seem unfair, but it is my salvation. It's a great tragedy, and yet it has brought my transformation. It may be horrendous, but it is our hope for eternal life. And the same cross 
and the story of the cross is for us today still good news. And for every one of us who would trust in him, it is our victory. Let's stand and sing. Come if you need to. Hi. We have the same.